were right about Lee Sin being banned. We thought it might come from the Wolves' side, but either way, banned out nonetheless. On the other side, Lulu taken away from Alex Aatrox. He's got to be casted in here, the final ban. Yeah, casted in. It will mean that we have obviously Lee's open. We also have Lucian for the first big option. And also LeBlanc is open for Gambit's side. Wow. Actually, casted in is open. Whoa. Wow. And that gives them... Whoa, okay. <laughs> there we go. Darian fist pumps and Darian says, so there happy. we go. Thank you very much. Casted in first pick. The Wolves set out there to say, okay, they're going to get casted in or they're going to get Lucian. There was a time that a champion was thought to be so good and so powerful, you weren't allowed to play him. In one of the last patches of his dominance, Riot themselves note that these are some short-term weeks to knock his power levels down a peg while we continue testing. Maybe someone, somewhere, will get to play him in a ranked game. And as far as that last line goes, they meant it. 95% ban rate wasn't a joke. It wasn't a meme. It was real. There was a time that your chances to win the lottery were higher than your chances of locking in Cassidy. To celebrate 10 years of League of Legends, let's take a look at one of the oldest and most important champions in the history of the game. Just like League of Legends, Cassidy 2 is celebrating his 10th birthday as a champion. And it's been an insane ride, one of astronomical ban rates, frustration, free wins after level 16, and of course, arguably the most famous play in League of Legends of all time. As far as the timeline, let's understand where we are here. The time in which Kassadin held this extreme level of power was from mid to late 2013 and on into early 2014. The Reign of Terror would eventually come to an end on patch 4.4 where he would be reworked, but we'll get to that in a bit. In order to understand the story of his 99% presence in solo queue, which is a League of Legends record that is probably unbreakable, we have to go back in time a bit further, to the early days of League. Let's make something clear. When talking about Season 3 and Season 4 Kassadin, some of you may say that he was the most overpowered champion of all time. And for that, you might actually be right. But he wasn't the most powerful champion ever. And there's a key distinction in that phrase. Something being overpowered or overtuned is always relative, meaning in relation to the rest of the field of champions that you could possibly play. Something by rule could only be overpowered if other things are in relation to that underpowered. Sure, Jax is a good champion right now. With Spear of Sojin and Conqueror, he's in a great spot. But comparing him now to Beta Jax, it's no competition. Beta Jax was on another level, and this is largely because the general power level of champions in the beta was the highest of any time during the game's history. What made Kassadin so strong during 2013 and 2014 is not that he was even the most powerful version of Kassadin that we've ever seen, but actually if you just compare him to the rest of the champions in the game at the time, he was absurd. This was during a time where champions were consistently nerfed and reworked from their early season power levels back in 2009, 2010, and 2011, while new champions weren't nearly as overloaded with mobility like they are now. It just feels like every new release these days just tops the rest, and mobility and overloaded kits are at an all-time high. Kasten in the early seasons of League was infamous for his insane mobility and his silence, which honestly is something that we've grown accustomed to seeing in Season 9. Kasten's design was based very closely to that of the Anti-Mage from Dota, a hero who is known for specifically being good at dealing with magic threats. Throughout his concepts, release, and even now in 2019, Kasten and the gameplay team have done what they can to stay true to this theme. Magic damage reduction, magic damage shields, and being able to be an off-tanky bruiser who can build health and MR, but also still be a mage. However, 
On his release, Cassidon was bonkers. He was nerfed immediately following his arrival to the Summoner's Rift. Originally, Cassidon's abilities did a couple of different things. To start off, his W used to steal mana from its target, rather than just restoring mana for himself, which was the first and last of its kind for this type of ability in League of Legends. Those who played any time before patch 4.4 will also remember that obviously his Q had a silence. These days, it's more of a simple channel disruptor, which is kind of a silence of sorts because technically he can silence Katarina from using her R, but it's not really the same as a real silence. Right away, his R was nerfed, with a late game cooldown increase and a mana cost increase. A couple of weeks later, his Q's AP ratio was nerfed as well. Weeks and months later, he was hit with two more direct nerfs to Force Pulse back to back, increasing the number of spells needed to activate it, as well as the AP ratio. And after his release, it does kind of make sense that he was too strong due to him being the only champion in the game with that kind of insane mobility. But because of the massive amount of nerfs, and the fact that the meta did not favor him at the time, after being very strong in the game for a couple of months on release, he was pretty bad during Season 1. When I say the meta was bad for him, remember that back in these days the best known strategy was to play an ADC in the mid lane, such as Ash. For Cassidy, you can't possibly pick a worse matchup for him than an AD range champion. So this would lead to our purple friend having a few buffs along the way towards Season 3. His passive and his Q would receive some decently significant buffs, as well as his W having a nice little bonus to allow him to farm easier during the early game. On top of that, Riftwalk would have its late game base damage reduced, but in compensation have its AP ratio increased by 30%, which overall is a big buff because by the time you hit level 16, losing 40 flat damage for a 30% ratio increase will always be a lot more damage gained than lost. So now we have the story for the early seasons, from on release where he was super overpowered, till now where he really wasn't that strong and needed to receive some buffs, let's jump ahead to season 3. As we know from all playing this game for many years, direct changes aren't the only changes that can help out a champion, and make them a lot stronger. To go back to the Jax example from earlier to make things simple, again, the introduction of Conqueror and Spear of Sojin are direct changes to the game, but indirectly have helped Jax become stronger. For Season 3 casts, he was not directly changed, but the new starting items that were put into the game, most notably Crystal and Flask, helped him get through the early game a ton. This item was today's equivalent of Corruption Potion, which is what the item was actually reworked into, except it was even more sustained. When you started this item, it didn't even cost the full amount of starting gold, so you got your 3 charges of Flask, as well as being able to buy even more potions after that. Nowadays, Corruption Potion does deal a bit of damage while it's active, but it costs the full amount of starting gold, and you are completely restricted from buying more potions. The sheer amount of sustain that you were allowed to get really increased the chances and likelihood that you will get out of the early game on scaling champions, and with that being Cassidy's only true weakness, that was game changing. So as we approach the beginning of professional play for Season 3, there was a tournament to kick off the new season known as IEM. For that tourney, Cassidy, and more specifically a player by the name of Xpeke, would provide us with one of the most iconic moments of all time. I like it Nif's immediate lock in arms, it's like, okay, so you got around us? Well, I'm going to see him come powerballing straight towards us, I'm just going to push my ultimate, push you straight away again. And once that powerball is run out, Ramus is a little bit stuck for quite a while and can't come back in and engage, so that's a fairly large part of Fnatic's lineup taken out of the picture. But with their last pick, they picked up that Cassidy. Cassidy, like who is a big champion in Ocelot's roster. But this time, Peke is going to run it up against him. And Ocelot looks like he's the one that's taking the lead. Massive wave for them going towards the Nexus turret right now. Fnatic have to get back and deal with them. Meanwhile, you can see that SK Gaming are just keeping them delayed. They've got two inhibitors down. And they are just going to pile straight up towards those super minions in the base. You can see there's coming in there. Peke is definitely up towards the Nexus. Kevin is going to be able to go oh towards him. He's trying to do it. But meanwhile, they're in the base. Yellow Star's trying to defend them in the base. Peke is trying to take the Nexus down. Is anyone going to be able to deal with this one? Catches him with another X. He's very low. Oh! Oh, 
There were so many emotions with this play. The fact that the game was as long as it was. The insane and perfect use of Kassadin's Riftwalk to delay the Olaf from killing him. And the fact that he not only started on very low health, but he lived literally on one hit to get the last auto attack on the Nexus would all compile to be a fitting victory for the Fnatic and SK rivalry in Europe. This play captured millions of eyes and hearts of League of Legends fans, inspiring so many people to root for Fnatic, love Xpeke, and just as importantly, start playing and learn how to play Kassadin. This is a crucial play in the story of Kassadin, because you have to remember, during this time, meaning the beginning of Season 3, this is not actually when Kassadin was his strongest during that season. That would not come until the middle of the season on patch 3.13. That would be a couple of months down the road from this play. But when the patch would come out later on, it would have given the players a couple of months of solo queue to practice Kassadin. His ban rate, his pick rate, and his general popularity began growing faster than ever after this play. He was a strong champion who became even stronger because more players wanted to main him and succeed with him. More practice equals better results. He was a very popular pick and started seeing more awareness in high elo solo queue and professional play. And because of the Kassadin hype train, Riot knew that they would have to do something about it. But, to be honest with you, they messed up. Badly. Patch 3.13 much like patch 4.20 and patch 5.22 will go down in the record books as one of the biggest mistake patches in the game's history. Kassadin was already very strong, so this change that Riot gave him was completely intended to be a net neutral change for his power, and ultimately just shift his power a little bit. It was not intended to be a nerf or a buff, but rather an adjustment. But they failed. They failed really really hard. You can even see it in their writing. They spell it out for us perfectly in the context. Currently, we feel like Kassadin's play beyond the laning phase is too safe, especially when he gets ahead. He can deal consistently high damage at range with Null Sphere and Force Pulse while holding on to Riftwalk for a safe escape. These changes are focused on forcing Kassadin to use Riftwalk as a significant part of his damage output, which also gives opponents opportunities to capitalize on his mistakes. Alright, fine, makes sense, in theory and in writing, but what did they actually do to him? There are a couple of big changes. Firstly, and most importantly, his early game silence was buffed. As Kassadin, you will absolutely take a late game base damage nerf for an added half a second silence at level 1. On top of that, the ability did less damage, but it also became more spammable as its mana cost was reduced. The silence was buffed at all ranks except for the very last one, where you only lost a tenth of a second off of the silence from 2.6 to 2.5 seconds. This was already a huge buff, but they weren't done there. His ultimate would end up having one of the biggest buffs I've ever seen. And to be honest, this really shows the progression that we've made over the years in League of Legends. This is so obviously a buff in Season 9, and if we saw this on the PBE today, we would all be saying, wow, this is a huge buff, now refunds 50% of the total mana cost when it hits a champion. 
Back then, at least from the get-go, it wasn't seen as that impactful. Whether it's through better understanding of how the game works over the years, how much better people are at using their abilities and landing their skill shots, or a combination of multiple factors, it just seems like we would know better than this in today's game. It was a different time back then. The aftermath of this patch would never be forgotten, because immediately, Kassadin rose to utter dominance. There was no way to beat this champion. So, you kind of remember that whole thing about Kasten being an anti-mage and being a potent threat against AP champs, but struggling heavily against AD champions, in turn making him a situational counterpick, you know that stuff? Well, just go ahead and throw all of that out the window, because a 1.5 second silence at level 1 is helpful for beating everyone, not just mages. This ends up meaning that a Zed can't combo you. This means that Talon couldn't cast R. This means that Rengar might jump on you, but then he can't throw a Bola. He became a solid pick into almost any situation, and while he could be countered by the likes of an ADC mid lane or a lane swap to force him to 2v1 or something crazy like that, it didn't really matter because of the massive buff on his ultimate. The sustain that you got early game helped Cassidy ensure that he will get to level 6, and then he can get some AP, clear waves, and get to level 11. Once he gets to level 11, he would be strong enough to fight anyone, and once he's at this point, you could just stick him in a side lane where he can silence somebody for 2.5 seconds, rift walk all over their face, kill them, and start snowballing to level 16. Once he hits 16, everyone, and I mean everyone, is dead. Cassidy turned into a different champion, named Cassa Win. You pick Cassidy, and you win. It's a simple formula. The ensuing months would be full of memes of Cassidy's reign of terror over the Rift, and they were pretty funny. If you remember, this was the high point of meme culture back in 2013, with that really big white text and everyone posting them to apps such as iFunny. We had ban rate memes, we had keep calm memes, we had t-shirts for $20 reminding you and your loved ones to make sure to always ban Cassidy. Similar to the way that Kasten would snowball hard in-game, his popularity and the idea that Kasten should never be let through champion select also snowballed. Your friends who introduced you to League back then when you're just starting out probably were always banning Kasten, so you do too. You may even ask them why to ban Kasten, and they simply tell you, he's OP, just ban him. For those who watch competitive play, this also carried over too because he was banned a metric crap ton there and pretty much never let through champion select as well. So for esports fans and impressionable newer players to also see their favorite pros banning Cassidy, well, <laughs> good lord then, I guess I just never let this guy through champ select ever again. Players had months of practice on him while he was getting more popular because of Xpeke, so if he ever did get through, he would absolutely crush the opposition, making it even more likely that those players on the enemy team would never forget the day they forgot to ban Cassidy and never not ban him again. 80% ban rate turned into a 90% ban rate, which turned into a 95% ban rate, which clocked in eventually around a 97% ban rate, which is a record today. I've even heard stories and seen players claiming that his ban rate was almost near 100% at times, and by the end he was barely ever played in ranked because he was banned in millions of games per month. On League of Graphs, you can see in his history, and according to League of Graphs, it looks to be right around a 90-95% to ban rate. If you combine this with the 5% pick rate at the same time from League of Graphs, then this gives us close to a 100% picker ban rate. Just think about how crazy that is. Think about how hard it would have actually been to get your hands on him in ranked. Math tells us that if he's at a 95% ban rate, that means that out of every 100 games of solo queue you play, he will not be banned in 5 of those 100. So even if you played all day long, something like 10 ranked games a day, you had 5 champion selects per 10 days of playing all day long to play him. Now, you also have to think about how ranked used to work back then. It was first pick, first serve. The guy who got first pick on both teams did all of the banning and got to pick first. There was no role selection or autofill. Back then, you know what autofill was back then? Last pick. If you were last pick, you were support. Simple as that. So think about it like this. Assuming you are equally as likely to get first, second, third, fourth, or fifth pick, 
which you would hope the system worked like that, then that means that out of those potential five games of casting that were left open every 100 games, you were probably first picked in one of them. And that would be your only hope of ever even getting him. If you think about that fifth pick, who is probably going to play support anyway because mid was the most popular role, so definitely doesn't mean you're getting mid. If you're last pick, you're not getting mid. To also hope that by the time your fifth pick is up, Kasten is still open? Heck no, think again, no way. It didn't matter if your mid laner first pick has never played mid in his life, never played cast in his life. If you think he's not going to first pick cast in, not only because he wants to play it, but also to make sure that the enemy team isn't going to play it either, you're definitely mistaken. All 10 players in champion select were cast in mains if he's open, bud. This equates to the rough odds that every 100 games you play, you have one shot, one opportunity to play him. Every 1000 games of solo queue that you play, there may be 10 games that you could play him. Which, by the way, is also assuming that nobody dodges. Because if they see that you first pick Kassadin and say, oh, oh, okay, we forgot to ban Kassadin, no worries guys, I'll dodge, there was honestly probably a better chance that you'll win the lottery rather than getting to play him. One of the other massive reasons he was so strong is because of the range of his rift walk being 700. Right now, Kassadin's range on his R is 500, and it's been that way for a couple of seasons now and seems to be the perfect range for Riot to finally balance how far he can move. Unfortunately, because I don't have a time machine or access to a private server to play on the Season 3 version of the game, it's really hard to show you exactly how far 700 range is for Kassadin's R, but thankfully there are other ways to visualize it. After maxing your Q at level 9, when you turn on your rockets, Jinx has exactly 700 range. So we can use her auto range and the range indicator to show exactly how far that is. This is the radius of 700 range. This is how far you used to be able to rift walk. And this is really far, actually. The amount of opportunity to outplay, engage, and escape with that added 200 range is pretty nuts. Think about how much easier it would have been to get away from anybody, as well as chase them down, on top of being able to traverse the map and move wherever you want with the additional 200 range on every single rift walk. For comparison, Teemo has exactly 500 range on his auto attacks, and we can take a look at his radius as well and how far Teemo can auto attack, which is significantly shorter. If you compare the difference, it's pretty staggering, and you have a lot less omnidirectional movement, which does eliminate a lot of the options for your gameplay. Standing in the pixel bush is a good way to see how much further you could go between 500 range and 700 range. Again, 500 range is what we have today on Kassadin's ultimate, and this ability is really good at this range, which is why I don't think it's been changed in so long. It's the butter zone for what it feels like it should be, not too long or too short. For professional play, it was rare, if ever, that Kassadin would be let through. A quote from GameFAQs user Kajal does a pretty good job of summing up exactly what made him problematic. Cass always showed up at the worst possible time out of nowhere and was nearly impossible to kill unless you somehow managed to 100-0 him or ambush him. And because Cass naturally built tankier than most mages, not enough to tank properly but more than enough to survive most assassins initial bursts and GTFO, he was ridiculously hard to kill, chase, escape, or generally fight. Because if you're one of the champions who could fight him head on, you're almost certainly not one of the champions who can chase him down. Many articles from esports writers and websites would pop up and chime in on why a champion was so powerful that even the pros didn't know how to beat it or at least didn't want to deal with it. An article on Team Dignitas' website written by Masterai123 does a pretty excellent job describing the fear of Casa Win. To paraphrase and summarize what he's talking about, he does note that the ban rate and the way that he was banned was very interesting. He was considered a free win by many people, and the blue side, the first pick, would often not ban him because they just assumed that purple side would ban him, which makes sense, you don't want them to have it. However, if purple side didn't ban him, then you were almost completely pigeonholed into picking him because you definitely didn't want them to get away with not banning him, as well as getting Kassadin, so you had to first pick him. 
Truly, the problem was that not many people got to practice Kassadin because he was banned completely permanently in solo queue, he was permanently banned in competitive play, so if it was ever let through, that was really the only time you got to play him. If you didn't know how to play Kassadin, you might even have to first time him on stage because you definitely didn't want the enemy to have him as well, and this left a couple of Kassadins being completely hard counterpicked and actually doing pretty poorly even though we all knew the champion was problematic. It's very possible that Riot's hope for preseason and early season 4 is that we would see a change to Cassidy indirectly. Maybe somebody would find a counterpick. Maybe a team would be able to beat it consistently at the pro level. Maybe, just maybe with our new season 4, someone will be able to prove that Cassidy is not as OP as he seems, but that wasn't the case. It was very evident that things were not going to change, and without direct interference from the devs, there was nothing that could be done. So they booted up a new project, Project Kassadin Rework. It seemed like the only logical option, there was no way that he could be balanced in this state. He was due for a visual update as well, but that would end up coming at a later date because he was in such a desperate need of change right now, that it would be almost a full year later until he received his updated animations, character model, ability icons, and voice. Right before the rework on patch 4.3, Riot notes that this is just a band-aid fix right before his list of big changes and his rework. They knew it was all going to change soon, so they hit us with one last patch before he'd be changed forever. On patch 4.4, a couple of weeks later, his dominance over Summoner's Rift was finally over. He was reworked, now having a magic damage shield on his Q, as well as the removal of his Silence. His Rift Walk had his 50% mana refund completely removed, and his kit largely resembles what it is today. The general consensus on the changes? Well, yeah, he sucked. He was terrible. For some, this was sad, from the best champion in the game, now to one of the worst. For others, it was good riddance. Although Kasten is a shadow of his former self, it's nice to know that these days, he's probably one of the most balanced champions in the game. Into team comps that he's really good against, such as a full AP comp or against the Aurelian Soul matchup, he shines, he can snowball, and he's very effective. However, place yourself against a Lucian or a Talon mid, and you're going to get bodied. He's a niche champion, which is exactly what he should be. Cassidy mains have it pretty good right now. He's solid, he's not banned or picked too much, and he's not generally hated too much either. When you get the right team comp and you get that snowball rolling, You'd be hard pressed to find another champion as fun as Cassidy. Get to your level 16 and start carrying. Anyway, if you enjoyed, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more. And thank you very much for watching.